thrones and even dynasties were in the melting pot between the reigns of Edward III and Henry VII, so there were quite sufficient doubts and perplexities to satisfy the energies of any aspirant to royal honours, however militant he might be. Henry VII's time was so far unpropitious that he was the natural butt of all the shafts of unscrupulous adventure. The first of these came in the person of Lambert Simnel, the son of a baker, who in 1486 set himself up as Edward Plantagenet, Earl of Warwick, then a prisoner in the Tower, son of the murdered Duke of Clarence. It was manifestly a Yorkist plot, as he was supported by Margaret Duchess Dowager of Burgundy, sister of Edward IV. The pretensions of Simnel were overthrown by the exhibition of the real Duke of Warwick, taken from prison for the purpose. The whole significance of the plot was that it was the first of a series of frauds consequent on the changes of political parties and served as a model for the more serious imposture of Perkin Warbeck some five years afterwards. Although Lambert Simnel's enterprise had miscarried, Margaret, Dowager Duchess of Burgundy, did not despair of seeing the Crown of England wrested from the House of Lancaster and determined at least to disturb King Henry's government if she could not subvert it. To this end, she sedulously spread abroad a report that Richard, Duke of York, the second son of Edward IV, had escaped the cruelty of his uncle Richard III, and had been set at liberty by the assassins who had been sent to dispatch him. This rumour, although improbable, was eagerly received by the people, and they were consequently prepared to welcome the new pretender whenever he made his appearance. After some search, the Duchess found a stripling whom she thought had all the qualities requisite to personate the unfortunate prince. This youth is described as being of visage beautiful, of countenance majestical, of wit subtile and crafty, in education pregnant, in languages skilful, a lad in short of a fine shape, bewitching behaviour, and very audacious. The name of this admirable prodigy was Peterkin, or Perkin Warbeck. No better tool could have been found for the ambitious Duchess of Burgundy, and when he was brought to her palace, she at once set herself to instruct him thoroughly with respect to the person whom he was to represent. She so often described to him the features, figures and peculiarities of his deceased, or presumably deceased, parents, Edward IV and his Queen, and informed him so minutely of all circumstances relating to the family history, that in a short time he was able to talk as familiarly of the court of his pretended father as the real Duke of York could have done. After he had learnt his lesson thoroughly, he was dispatched under the care of Lady Brampton to Portugal, there to wait till the fitting time arrived for his presentation to the English people. At length, when war between France and England was imminent, a proper opportunity seemed to present itself and he was ordered to repair to Ireland, which still retained its old attachment to the House of York. He landed at Cork and at once assuming the name of Richard Plantagenet, succeeded in attracting many partisans. The news of his presence in Ireland reached France and Charles VIII, prompted by the Burgundian Duchess, sent him an invitation to repair to Paris. The chance of recognition by the French king was too good to be idly cast away. He went and was received with every possible mark of honour. Magnificent lodgings were provided for his reception, a handsome pension was settled upon him, and a strong guard was appointed to secure him against the emissaries of the English king. The French courtiers readily imitated their master and paid the respect to Perkin, which was due to the real Duke of York. And he, in turn, both by his deportment and personal qualities, well supported his claims to a royal pedigree. About this time, however, the breach between France and England was lessened, and when friendly relations were restored, Henry applied to have the impostor put into his hands. Charles, refusing to break faith with a youth who had come to Paris by his own solicitation, refused to give him up and contented himself with ordering him to quit the kingdom. Warbeck thereupon in all haste repaired to the court of Margaret of Burgundy, but she at first astutely pretended ignorance of his person and ridiculed his claims, saying that she had been deceived by Simnel and was resolved never again to be cajoled by another impostor. Perkin, who admitted that she had reason to be suspicious, nevertheless persisted that he was her nephew, the Duke of York. The Duchess, feigning a desire to convict him of imposture before the whole of her attendants, put several questions to him which she knew he could readily answer, affected astonishment at his replies and at last, no longer able to control her feelings, threw herself on his neck and embraced him as her nephew, the true image of Edward, the sole heir of the Plantagenets and the legitimate successor to the English throne. She immediately assigned to him an equipage suited to his supposed rank 
appointed a guard of 30 halberdiers to wait upon him and gave him the title of the White Rose of England, the symbol of the House of York. When the news reached England in the beginning of 1493 that the Duke of York was alive in Flanders and had been acknowledged by the Duchess of Burgundy, many people credited the story and men of the highest rank began to turn their eyes towards the new claimant. Lord Fitzwater, Sir Simon Mountfort and Sir Thomas Thwaites made little secret of their inclination towards him. Sir William Stanley, King Henry's Chamberlain, who had been active in raising the usurper to the throne, was ready to adopt his cause whenever he set foot on English soil, and Sir Robert Clifford and William Barley openly gave their adhesion to the pretender and went over to Flanders to concert measures with the Duchess and the Sham Duke. After his arrival, Clifford wrote to his friends in England that knowing the person of Richard, Duke of York, perfectly well, he had no doubt that this young man was the prince himself and that his story was compatible with the truth. Such positive intelligence from a person of Clifford's rank greatly strengthened the popular belief and the whole English nation was seriously discomposed and gravely disaffected towards the king. By means of his spies, Henry, after a time, succeeded in tracing the true pedigree of Warbeck and immediately published it for the satisfaction of the nation. At the same time, he remonstrated with the Archduke Philip on account of the protection which was afforded to the impostor and demanded that the theatrical king formed by the Duchess of Burgundy should be given up to him. The ambassadors were received with all outward respect, but their request was refused. Almost at the same instant he arrested Fitzwater, Mountfort and Thwaites, together with William Daubeney, Thomas Cressener, Robert Ratcliffe and Thomas Astwood. Lord Fitzwater was sent as a prisoner to Calais with some hopes of pardon, but being detected in an attempt to bribe his jailers, he was beheaded. Sir Simon Mountfort, Robert Ratcliffe and William Daubeney were tried, condemned and executed, and the others were pardoned. Stanley, the Chamberlain, was reserved for a more impressive fate. His domestic connection with the King and his former services seemed to render him safe against any punishment. But Henry, thoroughly aroused by his perfidy, determined to bring the full weight of his vengeance upon him. Clifford was directed to come privately to England and cast himself at the foot of the throne, imploring pardon for his past offences and offering to condone his folly by any services which should be required of him. Henry, accepting his penitence, informed him that the only reparation he could now make was by disclosing the names of his abettors, and the turncoat at once denounced Stanley, then present, as his chief colleague. The Chamberlain indignantly repudiated the accusation, and Henry, with well-feigned disbelief, begged Clifford to be careful in making his charges, for it was absolutely incredible had this man, enjoying his full confidence and affection, not actuated by any motive of discontent or apprehension, should engage in a conspiracy against him. But Clifford persisted in his charges and statements. Stanley was placed under arrest and was subsequently tried, condemned and beheaded. The King's authority was greatly strengthened by the promptness and severity of his measures and the pretender soon discovered that unless he were content to sink into obscurity, he must speedily make a bold move. Accordingly, having collected a band of outlaws, criminals and adventurers, he set sail for England. Having received intelligence that Henry was at that time in the north, he cast anchor off the coast of Kent and dispatched some of his principal adherents to invite the gentlemen of Kent to join his standard. The southern landowners, who were staunchly loyal, invited him to come on shore and place himself at their head. But the wary impostor was not to be entrapped so easily. He declined to trust himself in the hands of the well-disciplined bands which expressed so much readiness to follow him to death or victory. And the Kentish troops, despairing of success in their stratagem, fell upon such of his retainers as had already landed and took 150 of them prisoners. These were tried, sentenced and executed by order of the king, who was determined to show no lenity to the rebels. Perkin, being an eyewitness of the capture of his people, immediately weighed anchor and returned to Flanders. Hampered, however, by his horde of desperados, he could not again settle quietly down under the protecting wing of the Duchess Margaret. Work and food had to be found for his lawless followers, and in 1495 an attempt was made upon Ireland, which still retained its preference for the House of York. But Perkin, meeting with little success, withdrew to Scotland. At this time there was a coolness between the Scottish and English courts, and King James gave him a favourable reception 
being so completely deceived by his specious story that he bestowed upon him in marriage the beautiful and virtuous Lady Catherine Gordon, the daughter of the Earl of Huntley and his own kinswoman. For a time, Warbeck remained in Scotland, but when King James discovered that his continued presence at his court completely prevented all hope of a lasting peace with England, he requested him to leave the country. The Flemings, meanwhile, had passed a law barring his retreat into the Low Countries. Therefore, after hiding for a time in the wilds of Ireland, he resolved to try the affections of the men of Cornwall. No sooner did he land at Bodmin than the people crowded to his banners in such numbers that the pretender, hopeful of success, took upon himself for the first time the title of Richard IV, King of England. Not to suffer the expectation of his followers to languish, he laid siege to Exeter, but the men of Exeter, having shut their gates in his face, waited with confidence for the coming of the king. Nor were they disappointed. The Lords Daubeney and Broke were dispatched with a small body of troops to the relief of the city. The Cornish rebels accepted the king's clemency, and Lady Gordon, the wife of the pretender, fell into the hands of the royalists. To Henry's credit, it must be mentioned that he did not visit the sins of the husband upon the poor deluded wife, but placed her in attendance upon the queen, and bestowed upon her a pension which she continued to enjoy throughout his reign, and even after his death. It was a difficult matter to know how to deal with the impostor himself. It would have been easy to make the privileges of the church yield to reasons of state, and to take him by violence from the sanctuary. But at the same time it was wise to respect the rights of the clergy and the prejudices of the people. Therefore agents were appointed to treat with the counterfeit prince, and succeeded in inducing him, by promises that his life would be spared, to deliver himself up to King Henry. Once a captive, he was treated with derision rather than with extreme severity, and was led in a kind of mock triumph to London. And the farce was ended by the publication of a confession in which Warbeck narrated his real parentage and the chief causes of his presumption to royal honours. But although his life was spared, he was still detained in custody. After a time, he escaped from prison and fled to the Priory of Sheen near Richmond, where he desired the prior, who was a favourite with the king, to petition for his life and a pardon. If Henry had listened to the advice of his counsellors, he would have taken advantage of the opportunity to rid himself of this persistent disturber of his peace. But he was content to give orders that the knave should be taken out and set in the stocks. Accordingly, on the 14th of June, 1499, Warbeck was exposed on a scaffold erected in the Palace Court, Westminster, as he was on the day following at the cross on Cheapside, and at both these places he read a confession of his imposture. Notwithstanding this additional disgrace, no sooner was he again under lock and key than his restless spirit induced him to concoct another plot for liberty and the crown. Insinuating himself into the intimacy of four servants of Sir John Digby, Lieutenant of the Tower, by their means he succeeded in opening a correspondence with the Earl of Warwick, who was confined in the same prison. The unfortunate prince listened readily to his fatal proposals, and a new plan was laid. Henry was apprised of it, and was not sorry that the last of the Plantagenets had thus thrust himself into his hands. Warbeck and Warwick were brought to trial, condemned, and executed. Perkin Warbeck died very penitently on the gallows at Tyburn. Such, says Bacon, was the end of this little cockatrice of a king. <laughs>